Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the seminar. Uh, if you've taken a look at the schedule for this semester, you'll notice that we are highlighting some of the uh, wonderful postdocs that we have around campus. And uh, Dr. Huva Pantoja is here today to talk to us about his work in uh, the Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, Hoover works with uh, Jimena Bernal in the Behavioral and Sensory Ecology Lab and has a really unique um, uh, uh, experiential set. He is a bioengineer, so he's going to talk to us about some really awesome work on um, mosquito uh, acoustic, um, uh, I guess, uh, acoustic orientation and learning. And I'm really excited for this talk. We had a wonderful chat this morning, so I'm going to be quiet now and let, uh, let Hoover take over. Okay, hi everybody. I'm very excited about presenting um, in this seminar because you know that hey, I know that all of you are as excited of insects as I do. Uh, so I will present some of the work that I have been done doing here as a postdoc in Purdue, and some of the work I did as a PhD uh, student in Colombia. Um, and the reason why I'm so excited about insects is because I always like to think about these tiny organisms as tiny machines that are full of sensor and are capable of amazing stuff. And the sensor I'm studying is the ear, the acoustic sensor. And in insects, ears have evolved independently over 20 times across the body. So essentially, we can find an ear everywhere in the body of an insect. For instance, praying mantises have an ear here in the abdomen. But all, most of these ears are of a tympanic kind. And we know how they work because they work essentially as our ears. However, there are another kind of ear called flagellar ears. And the antenna is a good example of this kind. Um, and among, among insect, insects, the, the mosquito antennae are very, very sensitive acoustic sensors. And just to give you an idea of how sensitive they are, uh, think about this. The number of sensory cells in the mosquito antenna is comparable to the number of hair cells in the human cochlea, but in a volume 100,000 times smaller. Therefore, mosquitoes' ears may be the most complex found in insects so far. Um, so with that in mind, uh, this talk has been divided in two sections. In the first sections, I will talk about the role of hearing in mosquito biology and the antennas and ear. And in the second section, I would like to talk about some acoustic applications that can be develop, uh, developed to monitor mosquito populations or for mosquito surveillance. So most mosquito species uh, use hearing for mating. This figure in the left is showing um, the phylogeny of mosquitoes and close related families like phantom midges and frog biting midges. And the color in these squares show how much evidence do we have uh, of species using hearing for mating. So most species uh, use hearing for this purpose. Um, so essentially what, hap what happens is that a group of males swarm. Um, so in this region, you will see a group of males swarming and then a female will approach following a trajectory here and then males will detect the female and uh, track her and copulate. That's a group of males swarming. That's a female approaching the swarm then a male detects the female and then fly together and copulate. So the acoustic cues that mosquitoes use to communicate with cone specifics are called flight tones. And these flight tones are essentially the sound that mosquitoes produce with their wingbeat. You're probably familiar with this sound. Actually, it can be very annoying, annoying if you're in a in the tropics during a humid night. Um, and we can study these flight tones by using tethered mosquitoes. For instance, this figure shows a, the, an, a species called Iris aegypti, which is a, a species responsible for transmitting de dengue. So um, in the next video, you will hear first, 
uh, the flight tone of a male, then the flight tone of a female, and then the acoustic courtship uh, that happens when they interact. So that's a love song of Idris Egypti. But you probably noticed that the sound of males and females is different. And that's because the frequency of the sound that they emit is different. So males, as you can see in this figure, figure broadcast a higher frequency compared to females. And this frequency is equivalent to the wind beat frequency um, of, of this species. Um, but we can also use um, another representation to study this acoustic dyna dynamic called spectrogram. And the spectrograms are uh, time frequency representations. And essentially what you're looking at here is, is in the x-axis time and y-axis frequency. And this color shows uh, the amount of energy of different frequency components. So for instance, the female flight tone is represented by this um, red line in the bottom and the male flight tone is indicated by this red line in the top. However, it's not common to find tether mosquitoes in nature. So we developed this setup um, that uses a soundproof chamber and has an experimental arena uh, inside the soundproof chamber equipped with uh, microphones that are capable of recording mosquito flight tones. And by using cameras, we can reconstruct uh, the flight trajectory and the flight tone in parallel. So this figure shows, for instance, four mosquitoes uh, flying together. And the right panel shows the trajectories in three di dimensions. And the left panel shows the trajectories in two dimensions. Um, and if we combine those trajectories uh, with um, the recording of the flight tone, we can uh, analyze a video like this. For instance, in the left panel, we have the trajectories of male of a male in blue and of a female in red. And the top panel panels in the right show the coordinates in x axis and the coordinates in y axis. So essentially, when you see those lines in blue and red getting close to each other, it means that um, the, the male and the female are getting close. And finally, the panel in the bottom is showing the flight tone of the female at the top and the flight tone of the male in the bottom. Sorry, the flight tone of the male in the top and the flight tone of the female at the bottom. So you will see that when the lines uh, of the tra of trajectories come closer, First, the female increases its frequency, and then the male increases its frequency too in response to the female flight tone. So in this case, that was a rejection. But what I wanted to highlight with this is that um, these acoustic interaction are, are interactions are very complex because in mosquitoes, the acoustic cues are linked to motion, to their motion. And so we know that the auditory system has to overcome several challenges, but the antenna is a very good sensor in close range when mosquitoes are close to each other. However, some species use hearing for another purpose. They uh, females of some species use hearing to localize frogs and feed on their blood. And as you can see in the phylogeny, uh, this behavior has evolved independently in frog bite midges, at least one species of phantom midges, and two tribes of, of mosquitoes. For instance, uh, frog bite midges have been widely studied by Jimena Bernal. And these tiny organisms all also use acoustic cues for mating. We can hear uh, their sound. We 
which is very cute compared to mosquitoes and probably because these mosquitoes are smaller so the frequency is a little bit higher but they also um, use hearing to localize frogs as i mentioned so in the next video you will see frog bite images landing on frogs and then having blood meals That's a male frog calling. You can see the midges in the back. So all this evidence suggests that hearing frog calls to get blood meals has evolved from hearing flight tongue, uh, specific flight tones for mating. However, this kind of interaction is completely different because mosquitoes in this case are tracking distant frog calls. And um, until recently, we thought that the antenna was a bad sensor for long range interactions. However, studies performed by researchers at Cornell University in 2019 show that by using um, behavioral and neurophysiological experiments in a basketball court, that the antenna of Edis aegypti uh, can detect low frequencies even if the sound source is located at 10 uh, meters. So this evidence suggests that mosquito antennae can be used in long interactions, like for instance for foraging or predator avoidance. However, no studies so far have investigated mosquito hearing in this context. So we decided to investigate um, um, the localization of frogs and the detection of frogs uh, by um, using this, this unique species called Uranotenia lowii. This is a beautiful mosquito species that has like blue colors in the thorax and in the head. And um, females of this species localize the, uh, the barking tree frog um, to get blood means and finish the egg development. And this is, this is the frog they, they track. However, the mating behavior of this species wasn't clear. And if we look at, at the antenna of species that use acoustic cues for mating, we commonly uh, will see sexual dimorphism in the antenna. So if you uh, look at the male antenna, it's shorter and more plumose compared to the female antenna. However, the frog biting mosquito Uranotenia lowii does not uh, present that sexual dimorphism in the antenna. And the reduction of the male's plumose antenna has been associated with uh, non-acoustic mating strategies. So this suggests that uh, the frog biting mosquito does not use hearing uh, for mating. So Jimena and her students investigated the mating behavior of this mosquito and what they found is that the mating behavior starts with um, uh, when a male flights performing patrolling uh, behaviors until they reach a female in the ground. Then they intertwine one of the legs um, with one of the legs of the female. Then they try, they try to mount uh, the female from behind and trying to engage the, its genitalia with the genitalia of the female. And if they succeed, um, they will end in an end-to-end copulation position and they will copulate for half an hour or 45 minutes. So in the next video, um, and, this, and this behavior is quite similar to um, a species called Culiceta inorata and contact pheromones mediate mating in this species. So we believe that <clears throat> a similar strategy could be used by Uranotenia lowii. This video shows um, a male mosquito trying to engage its genitalia with the genitalia of the female, but the female rejected the male. Lots of rejections in this presentation. Um, however, if hearing frog calls evolved from hearing flight tones for mating, we predicted that the antenna of female Uranotenia lowii is suspected to detect distant frog calls but also that ancestral features 
that the volt to heat flight transformating are expected to remain in the antenna of Urano antenna lower, despite they change it to a non acoustic mating strategy. And we explored this, these predictions with Jimena and Brian um, here at Purdue. And to do so, we evaluated the antenna response. So if we zoom in in the bottom uh, of the antenna, we will see the final section of, uh, of the flagellum. And then the second antenna segment has inside the Johnson's organ, which is a sensory organ. Um, so when a, an acoustic cue reaches the antenna, sound induced vibrations will travel down and the antenna until reaching the Johnson's organ, and then this organ transform the vibration into electrical signals. So we investigated uh, the mechanical response or how the flagellum vibrates and the Johnson's organ response, or what is the neural response in the antenna. But to do so, um, we had to immobilize uh, mosquitoes um, by introducing them and gently pushing them from behind until their head is out of um, a piped tip. And then we use a drop of wax to immobilize them, leaving the antenna free to be recorded. So first we investigated the mechanical response at Sony Binghamton with the help of Ron Miles and Jean So by using this setup, um, so this figure shows an anechoic chamber which is uh, one of the most quiet places in the world. Actually, you cannot uh, be there more than 45 minutes because you will hear the blood flow in your skull and then hallucinate and that kind of stuff. So it's a very, very quiet place. And within that um, soundproof chamber, we have a laser vibrometer that records the vibration of any surface, even if it's a nanometric vibration. Then we had our immobilized spe specimen and then a speaker to play acoustic stimulus to evaluate the response of the antenna. And we monitor all the process from outside. Um, outside. So the laser records the vibration velocity of the antenna in response to sound. And this figure shows the mosquito with the, within the, the tip pipette and the laser point uh, pointing at the at the tip of the antenna and then we set a microphone right next to the the mosquito to measure the air vibration velocity so the microphone will measure how the mosquito was experiencing the motion of the air that is the the sound so for instance if we play a frog call uh, from three meters right uh, at three meters uh, this is the recording uh, obtained from, from the microphone, and we can hear it. And then if we analyze uh, the recording obtained from the vibration of the antenna, it looks essentially the, the same. And actually, we can hear that recording too. And it's really impossible to tell the difference between those two. So the antenna is a very sensitive sensor that can uh, mechanically detect frog calls even if they are located three meters away. Mm, but we also evaluated the mechanical response across frequencies. So this means the mechanical response means how good the antenna detects uh, specific frequencies. So this figure is showing in the x-axis frequency, we play tones with different frequencies. And then the y-axis is showing the uh, antenna ve velocity, so the vibration of the antenna, divided by the air velocity, so in reference of the motion of the air. And the red signal shows the response of the female, and the blue signal shows the response of the male. So the arrows are showing the best mechanical response of the female's antenna in red, sorry about this, is, is the opposite, the female antenna in red and the male antenna in, in blue. And values higher than one in this figure 
me uh, indicate that there is an, an amplification of the signal detected. So the antenna of this mosquito is a very good sensor between like 200 and 600 hertz. And, and, and like in a species that hear flag transformating, the female's antenna detects or, or is better at detecting lower frequencies compared to the male's antenna. But also the best response of the female antenna matches the dominant frequency of the call. So that's why we can, uh, we can uh, the antenna detected um, with such a good quality, the pro call, even if it's uh, three meters away. However, if we use the same figure, but then we add uh, the flight tone frequency, we can see that the females of this species had a frequency of around 600 Hertz. And that frequency matches the best response of the male antenna. And also, like in, in other species, males broadcast a higher frequency. I mean, the flight tone is of a higher frequency compared to the flight tone of the female. So this is the same uh, pattern that we can see in a species that use hearing for mating. And all this evidence suggests that ancestral features that are associated with the detection of flight tones for mating remain in the antenna of Uranotania lobii. But um, not only the mecha a mechanical response is necessary to detect a sound, we also need a neural response to that sound. So uh, with the help of uh, Gil Menda and Ronald Hoy at Cornell University, uh, we inserted tungsten electrodes uh, through a thin layer of cortical below the Johnson's organ to record the electrical signals from the antenna nerve. Then we amplify those signal and digitize them to, an, to analyze them. Um, and we had a, a sound source, a speaker, located at two meters from the specimen. We use the same technique to immobilize the mosquitoes, right? So we found, uh, as you can see in this figure, in the top panel, we have the, uh, the recordings of frog calls in the same position of uh, the mosquitoes. And yellow show yellow uh, indicate when when there is a, a stimulus. So when we broadcasted uh, frog call, and the top and the bottom panel in the bottom shows the neural response, and we can see there is a correlation between these spikes in the neural response and the frog calls that we play, and it's a very conspicuous response. But we also found, um, as shown in this figure that there is a direct uh, correlation between the stimulus intensity um, measuring decibels sound pressure level and the number of spikes, so the magnitude of, of the response. And also uh, we found that the antenna of Uranotenia lobii can detect uh, frog calls of intensities higher than 86 decibels. So around here in this figure, around 80, um, 80 six decibels that, and this, this intensity is equivalent to a frog calling at two meters. So these mosquito species will be capable of detecting and locating a frog calling at two meters. So this study has shown the first neuro neurophysiological and biomechanical evidence of the detection of distant frog calls by mosquito antennae. But also, we show compelling evidence showing that eavesdropping on frog calls is a behavior that was co-opted from hearing con specific formatting. But I wanted to highlight that uh, mosquito antennae are very sensitive ears used in close and long range acoustic interactions. And because these um, are such a good sensors, um, with the help of Pablo Sabatieri and with Tricanad here at Purdue, we are developing uh, mathematical models based on finite elements of the antenna of different species. For instance, this is the model of a female with an antenna lobii, the frog bite mosquito, 
And this is the antenna of a female Aedes aegypti, the species that transmits dengue. And we are uh, performing simulations to evaluate um, in these models. So to develop these models, we use um, morphological data of the flagellum, also material properties, but um, we also use our experimental data obtained from laser Doppler vibrometer uh, that shows, as I showed you before, the response across frequencies. And as you can see um, here, in red indicates the tip of the antenna and purple indicates a middle section in the antenna. So by using these models, we can fit out our, our simulations and then uh, analyze resonance modes. So for instance, um, this is the vibration at this frequency peak. So it's the main peak of, of the detection of frequencies, but there is also a uh, peaks at higher frequencies uh, like this one. And the difference is how the antenna uh, responds to those frequencies. And we can use this model to simulate interactions, for instance, um, between a female and a male Aedes aegypti. So if we simulate the antenna of males, uh, males will try to hear the tone of, of females. So in this case, 566 hertz. What is interesting is that in the simulation, the, uh, the x-axis is showing frequency and the y-axis is showing the amplitude, a relative amplitude of the simulation. And what we can see is that the target frequency is um, highlighted by the response. So the, the antenna is responding very well at that uh, specific frequency. And the same happens with the model of the um, antenna of females. In this case, if, an, if females want to hear uh, males, uh, they should be able to detect um, 733 hertz. And the simulation shows that uh, the first resonant mode has low frequencies, but the second resonance mode of the antenna, the second best vibration of the antenna, is capable of increasing the gain at that specific frequency. And finally, the same happens with the antenna of Uranotenia loei, females. If we compare the response of these interactions between a female Uranotenia loei and a frog call, the target would be a signal with 430 hertz. So if we compare the response between Uranotenia loei, the frog biting mosquito, and Idis aegypti, we can see that in the case of Uranotenia loei, the largest peak uh, corresponds to the frog call frequency. What this means is that all the, the functional design of the antenna um, allows to increase the gain for a specific target. So there are many things that we can learn from these acoustic sensors. And um, also we can, um, by using this model as question like this, how do mosquitoes localize uh, as sensors? Because this question might be simple, simple uh, in the case of humans, for instance, because we have this big head between our ears. So what we, what we, what happens is that when we are trying to localize a sound source, for instance, a frog calling from one side, we use the difference in the signal that we receive with one with each of our ears. So the blue line here shows the signal that we receive with our left ear and the red signal shows uh, the signal that we get with our right ear. And as you can see, there is a difference in the time in which a uh, sound arrives in one ear and the other. However, um, in mosquitoes, this is not the case because they don't have a huge head between their ears and because they are essentially uh, tiny, right? So the signal will be the same. So the question is, how do they localize the sensors? So Jimena uh, collected this data some years ago, in which she found that depending on the incidence angle of a sensors, 
the phase of the motion uh, between the antenna is um, it, it changes. So for instance, if the antenna is located at zero degrees, so in front of a mosquito, the antenna will move in phase. However, if you move um, the sensors from one side or the other, the antenna will start moving out of phase, like this video. So that could give uh, a si signals to the mosquito uh, to detect the uh, sensors. However, we don't know what physical phenomenon is producing this out of phase motion in, in the antenna. So, and the plan is to using these uh, models to, to study this question uh, too. So all the first um, section of the presentation was showing how important sound is for mosquitoes and how good mosquitoes are at hearing. And because of that, acoustic applications can be developed to monitor mosquito populations. Before coming uh, to Purdue, I was a PhD student in Medellin, Colombia. This is a very beautiful city in the tropics full of vegetation and with a very nice weather. But because of that, we have a, a heart health issues with mosquito-borne diseases, and especially with dengue, Zika, and chikungunya viruses that are transmitted by the species uh, Ibis aegypti. And there is no uh, cost-efficient efficient treatment to uh, stop this disease. So most of the control programs are oriented to reduce uh, the populations of the mosquito. And we do that by using traditional strategies that normally are based on insecticides, but there are a couple of problems. First, uh, mosquito populations are presenting more and more resistance to insecticides. And also these strategies require a high commitment of government and communities. And we don't have uh, that. So in the city there in past years, there have been really high outbreaks of Zika, Dengue and Chikungunya. So the city decided to implement new strategies to improve the effectiveness and the su sustainability of the control programs. And one of the strategies was the mass release of mosquitoes infected with Bolbachia um, implemented by the World Mosquito Program. And with, what this strategy does is um, it uses a bacteria that inhibits the transmission of dengue. And the program released thousands and thousands of mosquitoes infected with this bacteria into the city, in the city, uh, trying to change the population, the wild population with a, with a mosquito population infected with this bacteria. bacteria. So uh, this program requires to monitor those mosquitoes population. So mosquito surveillance is crucial. However, most of the traps designed to capture mosquitoes are designed to be used in open fields and backyards. For instance, this is the BG Sentinel that uses, a, uses a, an odor and lure called the BG lure and as a tractant uh, or, and also the contrast between, between black and white. However, when we have this scenario, this is a neighborhood uh, where mosquitoes were released, we needed to be able to capture mosquitoes in these small, small rooms in, in houses. And the other and lure can saturate the space and it's an annoying and the, tri the trap was too big for, for the rooms. So essentially it uh, didn't work. So one option was using acoustic traps and acoustic traps have been tested in, in, in different designs, for instance, this is a sound trap for gravid Ibis aegypti that broadcasts pure tones of around uh, 500 hertz. And it's a very efficient trap to capture males. However, in the case of females, it's not as efficient as the BG Sentinel. So we developed an, a trap for this specific scenario of Medellin. Uh, and this is a trap that can be it's a small trap that can be placed in the floor or in any table. It has a structure um, with a contrast in a suction area between black and white, and it's equipped with the speakers to broadcast acoustic lures. And then it has a collection bag and is powered by sunlight. 
And we tested two attractants. First, pure tones um, of 500 hertz, around 500 hertz, that were broadcasted at 10 decibels, uh, measured at 10 centimeters. Mm. But also, we developed these complex signals. This is again a spectrogram. And as you can see, uh, it has many, many frequency components in the signal. And what this wanted to do is to mimic um, kind of a, a swarm or what a, how a swarm will sound like. And these complex signals were broadcasted at 10 decibels, but then at 2 decibels for 9 minutes. So we reduced the intensity of, of these signals. And we tested this trap in small rooms um, by releasing 40 individuals in the room that mimic uh, a room in, in a Medellin house and perform recapture experiments from 4 to 6 p.m. And we found that these traps are very, very effective to capture males, even if there are uh, visual distract distractors. So um, the panel in the left shows our results in two hours of recapture for the trap broadcasting no sound uh, and trap and traps broadcasting pure tones and complex signals. So when with the acoustic traps, it was possible to recapture until the 80% of the males in two hours, which is a very good recapture rate. Um, and in the case of females, it wasn't as effective and um, the trap broadcasting complex signals were capable of uh, recapture more than 35% or around 35%. But we also tested these traps in semi-field conditions at the Mosquito Unit in Gainesville. And so this is a very large semi-field enclosure and almost half of a, a football a field. And, and we released 600 individuals and recaptured from 9 to 10 p.m. performing two replicates. So the setup was a Latin square using three traps and the BG Sentinel as a reference. BG Sentinel uses, as I showed before, this odorant uh, lure and acoustic traps broadcasted complex signals, pure tones, and then an acoustic trap uh, had um, pure tones plus the odorant lure. What we found is that in this scenario, the traps are not very good at capturing males they recapture uh, less than 4%, even the reference trap. Uh, but in the case of females, we found that our traps recapture a comparable number um, to the reference trap, the BG Sentinel trap. The only trap that didn't work was the one broadcasting uh, pure tones. So uh, by showing this, I just want to mention that acoustic traps are very promising because they are cost effective and are um, effective at, at attracting males and females. Um, but also more um, studies are showing that these acoustic traps can be very selective, so species specific. And finally, I wanna show you um, one study that we developed um, addressing out the automatic surveillance approaches. Um, because using flight tones, um, it is possible to, to develop automatic classification devices. For instance, this image uh, shows two approaches. In the left, uh, we can see that using our cell phone, we can record uh, flight tones in the colony or in the field or mosquitoes in a bag. And the idea is to um, developing kind of a shazam of mosquitoes this application that detects um, songs just by recording a tiny piece of the song, so something similar but with mosquitoes, or the BG counter developed by Biogens that uses an optoacoustic sensor. So when the mosquito crosses this space in this device that can be set in any trap, they leave uh, information uh, associated with the, the, the species, and it's a it's a way to monitor and count mosquitoes remotely. So we, um, oh, however, these approaches have an accuracy of classification around 65%. It 
even using the location of the recording. So we wanted to know if there is if it is possible to increase that accuracy um, by using machine learning approach. So we use a database um, elaborated by Change et al. Um, and collaborators that use optoacoustic uh, sensors. And these sensors are just composed by a um, light emitter and a sensor that captures that light. So when a mosquito interrupts the light beam, um, it produces an optoacoustic recording that is very similar to a recording, a microphone recording. It has similar properties than flight tones. And this database uh, contained four species of mosquito, two species of flight, with 5,000 samples per, uh, per class. Uh, so it's a very good database with a high um, quality um, because these optoacoustic sensors uh, don't have, I mean, have a very a better signal to noise ratio compared to microphones. So produce a better quality. And we use two approaches. One, artificial neural networks that essentially mimic the human brain structure and uh, support vector machines uh, that use like important uh, data points to separate or to classify uh, data into specific uh, classes. And essentially what we do is that we train these algorithms to identify a specific uh, characteristics and then uh, classify uh, the groups. So for instance, if we have, if we use um, artificial neural network to detect EDC GIP type, we can obtain this result. In the y-axis, I'm showing the 10 classes of the, of the database. We have EDC Gyptide, Drosophila simulans, Musca domestica, and female, female EDC Gyptide, uh, Culex, and so on. So our target class was female EDC Gyptide that in this figure um, corresponds to the column number four. And the colors in the column show the amount of samples that were classified. So for instance, around 600 or, uh, were correctly classified as EDC Gyptide and, the red, and many other samples were incorrectly classified as Culex kinsekefasiatus. And this gave an uh, accuracy of 67%. However, when we compare the properties of the flight tones between these two species, we notice that there is a high frequency overlapping uh, on the frequency of the flight tones. So as you can see, these two distributions are overlap in a, a 97%. However, uh, by optimizing the algorithms and trying two approaches in the test um, sample data set, we obtained by using artificial neural networks, 69% uh, of accuracy, but with support vector machines at 77%, um, which is surprising given the, the high overlapping in the frequencies. And one of the reasons we believe increase the, the accuracy is low frequencies that are generated by the interruption of the light uh, by the mosquito body. So we use that characteristic to improve the classification accuracy. And also it was, um, so we, the, this, this figure shows the distribution of many species worldwide obtained by using recordings from cell phones. And what it was surprising for us is that the two species that we just compared overlapped in this red region that I'm showing here. So frequencies, mosquito frequencies are highly variable and depend on, on features like temperature, genetics, or size. So one of the things that can improve uh, the accuracy of classification is that training of the classification algorithms uh, should be performed for a specific mosquito population in every location, in a specific location. So you can have um, a specific target and train your algorithm for, for that target. 
Uh, with that, I just wanted to give a couple take home messages. First, that the small size of mosquitoes and the specific characteristic of the use of hearing help produce these very particular neural and biomechanical mechanism that can inspire the development of new technology. And also that sounds provides um, with prom uh, promising targets to develop and improve technological solutions for control and surveillance of mosquito-borne diseases. Um, so I would like to thank uh, our collaborators, Ron Miles at Sunny Binghamton, Rob Hoy and Gil Menda from Cornell, uh, Pablo Nadway from here from Purdue, Dan Klein from the USDA and Catalina Alfonso and Frank Avila uh, from the, um, my former a research group at the University of Antioquia, also to my um, workmates in the lab, and of course the Bernas lab that um, has been very supportive during this year as a postdoc here, and I have had a great time because of them. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you like the you like the presentation. If you have any questions, I would like to answer. That was really awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have we, we started just a little bit late, so we can take uh, one or a few questions. Uh, I've been monitoring the Q&A and the chat. Uh, and you know what we can do if folks, um, if I remember how to do this correctly, we can actually have folks unmuted. But um, I think what we can do first is I'll just read Matt Dittman's question. So uh, yeah, let's just do that. So. Uh, Matt Dittman is curious if wing damage affects the frequency produced by the mosquitoes and affects mating success. Is wing damage even a concern for such a small insect? Uh, and you can see the question in the Q&A there, too, if you're curious. Um, OK. Uh, oh, yeah. So actually, uh, that's a really good question. Um, but. I haven't seen any uh, study that has addressed that. Um, so we know we know that size is um, affects the wind beat. Um, but the issue is that that these flight tones are linked to motion, right? So if mosquitoes can move, that probably will affect the flight on, but it's, it's really hard to know. There is a really good paper that shows the fluid that dynamics in the antenna of mosquitoes, in the, in the green bit of mosquitoes. So, um, but no one has addressed that specific question, Matt. So, uh, yeah, it would be really interesting to see what happened. How, just as a kind of a follow up, how long does a male mosquito um, of the, I'm going to forget the species name, uh, how long does a male mosquito typically live? So in the colony, for instance, Edis aegypti can live for almost, as an adult, for 20 days, uh, 15 okay. days. But in nature, uh, less, of course, but they can live like okay. many days. OK, so they could accumulate wing damage then. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's a possibility. Um, um, that's really cool. So uh, I'm going to jump to the second, just to make sure we get it. And this is from Matt Effington. Uh, is there a difference in the response of female mosquitoes of any species between pre-blood meal and post-blood meal individuals? Um, yeah, so you can read the question there. I think uh, I can't remember how to unmute you, Matt. I'm sorry, but uh, if if Hoover can uh, read that and answer it, that'd be we can get it that way. So yeah, that's also a really good question, and the short answer is. No one has tested uh, that yet. To, but I mean, what we have seen um, is that the acoustic dy dynamic be between males and females is very dependent on um, how rapidly females and males increase their flight tone when they interact. So those dynamics can be affected by all these uh, physiological and morphologi morphological changes. However, there are many unknowns 
Um, and that's a question that we could ask in our colony. And it would be really good to see like how all these changes affect not only not only um, from a physical perspective perspective of how, how uh, this work, but also testing fitness of males and females and interactions. Okay. Um, if anyone else has any, you can drop them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, I think we could probably get away with one more from the audience. Uh, but if not, I definitely have one. <laughs> uh, so, okay, nothing yet. So I, I'm, I, I was really um, taken taken by the variation in, in frequency that you showed there in that last, uh, the last few slides. Um, and I'm curious if you're, do you actually find differences in the, the ability of, mos the acoustic detection abilities of mosquitoes in different populations? So thinking about your um, frog mosquito model, do different frogs produce different signals and are mosquitoes in, the, in those populations tuned to different frog signals? Yeah, so that's a, a very interesting question. And uh, another student, Brian at Jimena, his lab investigated uh, more or less the, the or, or has preliminary data on an interaction network between frog bite images, which are these tiny images, but they also use hearing, and frog calls. So we know that there is a relationship between the frequencies they can hear. And one, one question that we are addressing is how their own flight tone and the flight tone that they hear when they interact with the male um, is associated with the acoustic or, or with the frog calls they are capable to, to track. So definitely that has like many, many, um, many features that affect that detection, for instance, morphological features, the length of the antenna can change, and their own flight tone produce a high intensity frequency that will affect hearing. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's the plan. Like we, we will try to understand more about these tiny guys and see how all these features interact um, in the detection of acoustic cues. Okay. Well, I don't see that. Thank you for that. Thank you for a really awesome talk. That was that was fascinating. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in, so we can we can end it here. Give you a little break before your next meeting. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, and thanks everyone for joining.